kind of a statement. Uh, we're going to ask them to keep it to about five minutes, and then uh, and then they'll be able to uh, one you know one by one take a question from the uh, the audience. They will choose who they're taking the question from, and then after they answer the question, which we're going to ask them to keep their answer to about two minutes, the other person will have a chance to also tackle it. It's all very simple. <laughs> all right, so we're going to ask them uh, both to come up here. And uh, Joe. Thank you, Ed. Thank you very much. Can everybody hear me? Yeah. Back yes. in the room? Okay, terrific. Well, thank you, and, and good afternoon. It's great to be here. Uh, amongst friends, and thank you, Senator Dabo, of course, uh, for being here. Uh, this is a very important election for many reasons. I know that many people are concerned with the presidential race, and they're excited about Obama and Romney and the debates and, you know, what's going on with the country, and, and that is exciting, and there's a lot to be excited about. But when it comes to the local issues and the, in, and the issues that impact you, in a very personal or direct way. It's your local elected officials, your council people, your assembly representatives, and your state senator who probably have the biggest impact on those things and the ability to help you probably much quicker than the president of the United States, whoever that may be. For the past three and a half years, I've had the privilege of representing a very large portion of Woodhaven in the city council. I, I share Woodhaven with Elizabeth Crowley. And we have worked on many issues with this civic, with the bid, with all the elected officials on making sure that, number one, we can deliver money back to the community, that we can uh, get a handle on the quality of life issues that bother people, the graffiti vandalism. We funded, uh, Elizabeth and I and Councilwoman Kozowitz funded an extra day of, of a litter basket service along Jamaica Avenue, uh, for instance. So we recognize that Jamaica Avenue is the main thoroughfare of the community. It's the economic lifeblood, it's the job creator in the community, and we know that the better Jamaica Avenue looks, and the more successful Jamaica Avenue is, the better off everybody who lives in Woodhaven will be. And so we have worked with the civics, with the other elected officials, and we've worked together on many issues to make Woodhaven a better place to live, to work, and to raise a family. That is something that I am very proud of. I love my job. I love what I do. I have the benefit of waking up each and every day you know, knowing that I can make a difference, that I can actually try to make things a little bit easier, a little, a little bit better you know, for people who are having a hard time or, or feel that they're not getting enough help from calling 311 or that they're getting the runaround from somebody else. So I have a very rewarding job to know that, that I can wake up every day and I can help others. It's what I do and I love to do it. I've also had the, the great benefit of, of being in the minority party, you know, in the city council. And, and that has afforded me a, a, a level of flexibility or independence where when I vote on, on bills or when I come out to meetings like this, you know, I don't always have to toe the party line. I can truly speak up for what I think is important to my constituents. Um, I can disagree with my party or stand up to them when I think that they're wrong, and I can agree with the Democrats when I think they're right. And there are many issues when that has happened. Now, for instance, this community rallied Democrats and Republicans alike when the city proposed closing the fire engine companies. That was something that we couldn't stand for. We rallied to bring back the senior center right to this building to make sure that it was handicap accessible. Working with the borough president, again, and other elected officials to protect the core essential services. We called on the NYPD to hire more police officers and to assign them to the local precincts because that was something that was very important to this community and to the people that lived here. So I suppose that we could sum up this election probably in, in, in three or four major issues if you live in Woodhaven. What do people want? Number one, they want jobs. They want jobs to be created. They want jobs to be protected. Everybody's for creating jobs. It's also important to make sure that we can protect the jobs that people already have. That we can prevent teacher layoffs, for instance. That we can prevent cuts to library services because they're going to lose employees and we're going to lose out on services. That we don't cut transportation in the community because we're already underserved when it comes to public transportation. So jobs is probably the number one issue. The number two issue that a lot of people are concerned about are taxes. Excuse me, Mario, yeah. one minute. Okay. Taxes. If you own your own home or you own a business on Jamaica Avenue, 
you are paying the highest per capita tax in the country. So providing tax relief for homeowners and small businesses so that they can stay in this community, so that they don't sell their home or, or give up their business and go to Long Island or New Jersey and other states, making sure that we can keep Queens affordable is very, very important for the people that live and do business in Woodhaven. And third is crime. I think people are very concerned with the state of the economy and the high unemployment rate that we cannot go back to the days when cars were being broken into, when businesses were being held up, when, when the quality of life crimes were on the rise. I think that people want to make sure that they can live in a safe community. And so I support, for instance, stop and frisk policies. I think it's been very effective in driving down crime to historic lows. I do not want to uh, tie the hands of the police. I do not want to police the police. I think they have a, a tough enough job to do, and I want to support them. So those are the issues that we're talking about, and this forum is very important for discussing those issues, and I look forward to answering questions and, and obviously, uh, you know, having a, a very spirited debate with, with our current Senator, Joe Devil. I'd be honored to have your vote. Thank you very much. Next, Joe. Thank you, and good afternoon, everybody. It is a pleasure being here, and I'm going to just take a moment of my time to acknowledge uh, Joe uh, Bergona. You know, I think it's great that we spent a moment to acknowledge Joe. I think Joe could have made millions of dollars probably promoting some camera company, because <laughs> you saw a camera, you saw Joe. And so it's, it's a great memory to be here today. And again, thank you very much. I want to thank the Woodhaven Residents Block Association and all the work that they do throughout the year, Ed, and your board, and the residents. Thank you for all that you do, and for certainly sponsoring this. Uh, ladies and gentlemen, thank you. It's been a privilege and an honor to represent you up in Albany for the past almost four years now in, 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 as your state senator. So thank you for giving me the opportunity. Uh, I, too, am thankful every day for getting up with the opportunity of helping people, all kinds of people, Democrat or Republican, doesn't matter. We're out there to help. And it's been a privilege and honor for me. Uh, and so this campaign really is about experience. It's about the experience of doing the work up in Albany. And it's about experience of working here in the community. Up in Albany, when I got elected in, in 2008 and served in 2009, we faced the worst fiscal situation our state arguably has ever been in. And with record spending cuts, $6 billion in spending cuts, we turned a page on wasteful spending in Albany. And we saved a lot of the essential services our state provides for its people. And now under Governor Cuomo, two on-time consecutive balanced budgets, again, still reducing spending in the state, no new taxes, and certainly turning the page, and again, I appreciate the governor's support of my candidacy. So we have been very positive up in Albany, the work that we've done there. It's about that experience, and I grabbed this experience that I had in the city council dealing with the city's worst fiscal situation back in 2002 on the heels of 9-11. So using that governmental experience for the benefit of my people. Locally, I, I love the work that we have done here in, in, in Woodhaven. Uh, senior centers. Title 20 money is in our state budget. If we don't get Title 20 money into our city sen uh, senior centers, the senior centers close. We were responsible for getting, even in the worst fiscal times, Title 20 money in the state budget down right here to this senior center, working with the Senate member Mike Miller to open up these doors. <laughs> and that was a huge victory. And senior centers throughout our district. Uh, Epic. We, we increased EPIC spending of $34 million. This is, a, this is a direct impact on the health care of our seniors, who will now be improved starting January 2013. They will see improvement in EPIC coverage. And we need to bring that positive information to our seniors. So right here in this senior center, I sponsored lectures on EPIC, on other health care issues. We did self-defense uh, lectures here, elder abuse lectures here, social security lectures here. It's about bringing active, active, accurate information to our seniors. Schools, working now with PS60 on a program that's going to educate children about saving money and how we can you know, educate them not only about saving money, but actually saving money and actually raising money for their PA group. And we're taking that program around to different schools in the area. It's about working for our veterans. Our veterans didn't realize all the exemptions that they were entitled to under the city until we did a town hall right in this building. And we had all the Queens posts here so that the veterans could learn about what exemptions they are entitled to. Why? Because veterans are the reason why I'm an elected official because of the democracy that they protected. It's about working with small businesses here along Jamaica Avenue. I was at the street fair speaking to a lot of small businesses. We need to do what we can for them. I've introduced four pieces of legislation giving small businesses tax credits if they hire those with disabilities, if they hire a veteran, if they hire a senior, if they hire a student. 
We have created monies in the budget, hopefully somewhere very soon, small businesses can get startup costs paid for by low or no interest, uh, no low cost or no interest loans. Incubators in the state to figure out where there is job growth. And talking about job growth, yesterday I did my sixth job fair, creating thousands of job opportunities for thousands, thousands of prospective employees. Looking for areas of growth, technology, retail, social work, matching those job openings to the people that really need the help. One minute. It's about protecting Jamaica Avenue. It's about protecting the residents. I'm about to introduce legislation that will call for a moratorium on foreclosures for one year. No more, no more foreclosures for one year to allow people to get back on their feet and to stop the abandoned home situation here in Woodhaven. And working with the banks to make sure that when they do own the property that they do the right thing by the communities and the residents. It is about quality of life here in Woodhaven. Woodhaven is rich in tradition. We want families to stay here. We want families to be growing here. And how do you do that? Protect Woodhaven. Make sure it's safe. Working with the 102 precinct, making sure it's safe. So we have a lot of work to do. I hope that you look at my experience, you see my record of accomplishments, and that you can vote for me on November 6th as we go forward in working for Woodhaven in 2013. Thank you very much, everybody. Thank you. Thank you. Eric, will you, you choose the first... Uh, First question? Surely. Thank you very much. <laughs> I'm just playing. I'm just All right. Okay. Well, ladies first, and then we'll go to you. That's all right. Now, I'll answer Arlene, and then, of course, well, this is for both of us? Or just yeah. Okay. All right. So what happens is you get, you get two, two minutes to answer, and then Joe gets to follow okay, up in well, a minute. That's fine. Go ahead. My question is about the, the casino. I have heard that uh, a lot of women of Queens residents, local residents, were promised jobs there, as well as the lady contractors and, and you know, different people. And the people that they hire are in low-level jobs, that they are bringing people from outside. I don't know how many dealers or people that would be qualified for that. But uh, I've also read that they have given a lot of money. They make millions of dollars, more than in Las Vegas. And uh, they are giving the money to the school. Yet our schools have no programs. Where is the money that they are giving to the schools? Why don't we ever get an accounting of that money? And why are school programs being cut when the casino tells us that they are pouring money into us? Okay, very, very good question. Uh, checks in the mail, right? <laughs> One of those famous lines. I have been to be quite honest with you, somewhat critical of the casino, of Resorts World. I live 10 blocks from Aqueduct. I live on, on uh, my wife and I live on Rockway Boulevard, 91st Street, in Ozone Park. I was here before the casino was here, when the casino said that they wanted to come here, that they were gonna create jobs for local residents. 70% was the number they threw out there. We didn't demand that, that's what they said that they would do for the community. The Daily News, foiled through freedom of information requests by zip code where the employees live. And by a stretch of the imagination, extending the outer zip codes, they said they only in fact hired 60% of the local residents, well below the number that they originally promised. Now, I have a big problem with that. Now, if you want to be a good neighbor, and you want to hold up to your end of the bargain, and I walk into Resorts World, I want to see people that live in Woodhaven, in Ozone Park, in South Ozone Park, some in Howard Beach, because it's certainly very close, right across from the conduit. I want to see white people. I want to see Latino and Hispanic people. I want to see Guyanese people. I want to see African American and, and, and black people. I want to see people that, that truly reflect the community and, and the southern part of Queens. Now, right now I'd say that's not the case, all right? I've been there on several occasions, and the facts show it. The Daily News proved it. With respect to education, yes, they have raised hundreds of millions of dollars for education. The problem in Albany is that, like the scratch-off tickets, they send it up to Albany, they put it in the education budget, and then when the governor or the legislature have to close budget holes in other areas or to pay for mandated services, they take the money out of the education budget, put it in the general fund, and then they don't replace it. So when you take money out of the kitty and you don't put money back into the kitty, you're shortchanging the schools. And so I have been somewhat critical because my job is not to defend the casino or to be a spokesperson for Resorts World. 
It's supposed to stand up for my community, to fight for my constituents, and to hold their feet to the fire and make sure that they hold up to their end of the bargain. That's my job as an elected official, and that's something that I have been doing. Thank you. Joe, you get two, you'll give two minutes. Um, I'm actually quite proud of the work that we're doing at Resorts World. Let's first go back to what the alternative was. Remember, we were losing Aqueduct. And again, I too live in the shadows of Aqueduct all my life, raising my family there. So I didn't want to lose Aqueduct Racetrack, the jobs there, and the thoroughbred industry. So we needed to save Aqueduct. The alternative was a developer looking at 200 acres of C8 zone properties that really, as of right, they could have built the worst thing in the world that would have been very damaging to our community. So if you close your eyes and think of the worst thing in the world that could be built there, that's what could have been built there. So we needed to do something, and quick. Um, so we now have something that generates revenue for the city, generates revenue for the state, and it is about jobs. We can argue about 60%, 70%. Frankly, as an elected official, I argued with Resorts World about I want 99%. I want all my people to get hired there. There's 1,100 jobs there. That's 1,100 jobs we never had. And yes, people from Woodhaven do work there. So we have thousands of jobs there, and we have thousands of jo jobs there yet to come. Don't look at Resorts World in a snapshot, ladies and gentlemen. There's still acres there, and they are going to build some type of convention center, some type of family entertainment center, some type of hotel. Thousands of jobs still await our people. And I will be with them, because I meet with them monthly, and I will be holding their feet to the fire about hiring local qualified people. That's number one. Number two. They do raise money for our, our education portion of our state budget. It's actually roughly about $290 million. That does go to the education portion of our state budget. And this year in the state budget, a fact, we have funded schools more than ever in the state's history in this year's state budget. So an extra $300 million from the state budget to our city schools. But here does lie the problem. So there has been a cut in education monies. You got money coming from the uh, results room. You have money coming from the state budget. Here's the problem. The money goes to Mayor Bloomberg. It's good to be the king. The money then goes to Mayor Bloomberg and he decides where the money goes in our city schools. That's an issue. Because we need to follow in the city budget, where does that money go to our city schools? I want to go to PS60. I want it to go to our area schools. I want even some of that money to go to private schools. So the idea here is we need to obviously have a better accounting. Lottery money, scratch offs, lotto, 70% of which 70% of which is administrative costs. Joe, you need to change time. that. Time. Thank you. Thank you. All right, Joe, you get to choose the next uh, questioner. Oh. Well, General, how does Anne Go ahead. Okay, we're just going to talk about the senior centers. How much money does the city have to spread around among all the different uh, centers? Uh, it's always again, money for money. I don't understand. I'm, I'm, I'm going to allow Eric to answer the question on the oh. city budget. For, for our purposes, we did fund Title 20, which does go to the senior centers. Epic, which has a direct effect on the seniors, 34 million. Uh, and there are other senior programs out there that have been funded in the state. Remember, as we get better off and financially more sound as a state, we can start to restore. You might have heard that the star exemption was, a, that, that we cut the star exemption. As a city resident, you never lost the star exemption. You always had it. What is that? I'm sorry. Star exemption. Star. 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 Now, in the state, we had a cut in 2009 because we basically couldn't afford it. We could not afford the star exemption. We're now getting that back because we are doing better financially. But as a city resident, you never lost the star exemption. So there are programs for seniors that are now being funded once again now that we're doing all better financially. So senior centers are number one. Senior exemptions, property exemptions, obviously very important. And we need to find out those programs that do work for our seniors. I am on the aging committee. I am on the agency, so during budget time and during legislative time, the seniors are a major focus of what I do up in Albany. So I will continue to do that work through the agent committee for our seniors. Okay, so to put an exact number on it is very difficult. And the reason why I say that is because there are some things like the state gives us $80 million in Title 20 money. That's money that they get from the federal government that they must spend on senior services throughout the state. And the city gets roughly about $80 million. All state? The state, now the city benefits $80 million out of the money, but, and I will give credit, obviously, to our state elected officials for fighting with both Governor Cuomo and before him Governor Patterson, who was the first person who wanted to take that money and use it for other mandated services. That was a big fight. We had plenty of meetings about it, and they deserve a lot of credit for, for fighting that fight on your behalf. 
There is federal money that comes in too, for instance, for caseworkers, uh, for uh, indigent seniors, for instance, for uh, meal transportation programs. I mean, there's a lot of different revenue streams that come into the city. The mayor, you know, has control over the city's budget because, you know, by the city charter, it's an executive budget. The council then is able to negotiate with the mayor before we pass the budget. We make restorations to cuts that he proposed. Uh, several years ago, for instance, we were very proud to make sure uh, that we didn't cut the Meals on Wheels program, uh, that we weren't going to allow the, the, the city to, to freeze some of the meals. That was something that came up uh, many years uh, in a row. They kept coming up with this proposal to save a few pennies. Uh, and we were very proud that we were able to restore the cuts to caseworkers for seniors that were either in uh, very dangerous living conditions or people that East, where uh, adult protective services had to get involved. We said if we're going to pass the city's budget, we realize that we're not going to balance it, not only on the backs of seniors, but that we really don't want to hurt the most vulnerable popu population, which is, of course, seniors with disabilities or, or, or ones living in very dangerous conditions. I would probably put the ballpark figure, this is not, you know, this is not for the newspapers because it, it, it's not a fact, uh, it's, it's not a very precise fact, but I would say in the, in, the, in the expense side, not counting capital without the federal reimbursements, in, in the three to $350 million range. Most recently, for, the New, for New York City, for senior centers, for meals programs, for transportation programs, for funding Catholic charities, for instance, for this, counting the discretionary money in that range. All right, thank you. All right, Eric, you get to pick the next question. Okay, Alex, go ahead. Go share the mic. There, there's a, a funny thing going on with this race. If, if I didn't work with you two gentlemen and, and haven't seen you and didn't show up to block association meetings, if I relied only on the mail I was receiving. I think that both of you, both of you are total sleazebags. That would be my opinion. I know that's not accurate. I know that's not accurate because I come to these meetings, I've seen you in action, I've had the chance to work with you. But here, here's, here's my issue. Oh, wow. <laughs> spread, it, spread it out. That's, this, this is all the negative like mail. This, this, <laughs> right, this, this, this is the negative mail yeah. that I'm receiving and that the people in the community are receiving. And uh, here's my question. Some other campaigns, for example, the U.S. Senate campaign in Massachusetts and several other campaigns, the Republican and Democratic candidates have come together to reach deals to try to limit the influence of outside parties in the election. For example, if uh, a negative mailer goes out or if a TV ad goes up from an outside group, the campaign who would nominally be the beneficiary would donate some of their campaign chests, to, their war chests to charity. So here's my question. No one wants to receive all this. It's not good for the environment. It's not good for our impressions of government. It's not good for you guys because no matter who wins, a whole ton of your constituents are going to have received lots of negative literature about you. So why haven't you guys come together to try to come up with some sort of creative solution to try to stop this? I mean, if you guys cannot come up with a creative solution to this, how are you going to come up with a creative solution to the partisan gridlock in Albany? It's a good, you know, it's a very good point. Yeah. I, hope, I hope everybody here is talking. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, you know, I mean, this is, this is an issue where uh, Joe and I agree, and we've said it at every meeting. <laughs> Unfortunately, our hands are tied by the Supreme Court, which protects the rights of outside interests, whether they be uh, labor unions or business groups or landlord advocacy groups, from spending money in what's called an independent expenditure. We do not approve this mail. When we see the mail, it's the day that it hits the mailbox. So, for instance, uh, I know that uh, Joe Adabo uh, does not appreciate uh, getting, uh, I'll just take one, what is this, uh, the, the, the award for raising taxes of the year, and my wife, you know, my wife didn't appreciate getting in the mail the war on women, especially when she's nine months pregnant. I mean, so, I know that Joe Nabo did not design this piece of mail. I know that he did not send it to my wife, because that is not the type of person that he is. He and I uh, have a, a very friendly, we go to the same church, we're both parishioners at Nativity, we have a great deal of respect for one another, we disagree on issues. Uh, sometimes we're passionate about how we disagree, but um, anything that my campaign has put out where you see Ulrich for Senate or anything that we have designed is overwhelmingly positive. And unfortunately, we are not able to legally 
coordinate with any other outside group or campaign to say stop it. Now, you know, I have said it should stop. I have said it's negative. I think people don't like it. I think it's a waste of money. I'd much rather him send out 20 pieces of mail saying how wonderful I am than trying to say how terrible he is. I think that, you know, I think that it would go a long way and, and it would reflect truly who I am and certainly who, who Joe is. And Joe is a gentleman and he's a terrific guy. I'm not voting for him. Um, but I happen, I happen to think that he's, I happen to think he's a fine man. And, uh, and again, this campaign is really just about issues and where I stand on issues and where he stands on the issues. So, you know, I'm denouncing these. I want them to stop. I think they're, they're awful and they're terrible and they're negative and I think that they're counterproductive and, and I think he'd say the same. Joe? Uh, yeah, I agree. I agree. You know, uh, common sense out of Virginia. I wish they'd stay in Virginia, but uh, truth is, no, I don't love parrots more than kids. I have two kids of my own. I, I love parrots, but I love kids more. Uh, let's see. No, I'm not voting for a pay raise. Uh, there's no bill in Albany. I'm not voting for it. If it does come, I'm not voting for a pay raise. I'm not running for Congress. I want to be in the state Senate, so this is not a stepping stone for me. These are all the things you hear. 2002, we raised taxes. Everyone knows why. To save the central services in the city. When I was in city council, we promised two years later we reduced those taxes. We did. Two years later, we reduced those taxes. 2009, we raised no property tax, no soda tax, no uh, uh, gas tax, but yet we did raise fees to save the state, and now we're reducing those. Those are the negative amounts that you get. I like to complain about it, but I also like to do something about it. I think it's wrong. You know, somebody had mentioned that our race is the most expensive state senate race in the country. In the country. Now, millions of dollars will be spent on this race. And I jokingly said, man, I am sure some senior centers, some schools, some veterans posts would love that money and can really use that money. It's a shame we waste it to an extent in a campaign. So I'd like to do something about it. I think you should have a plan. I have a plan. I have co-sponsored four pieces of legislation in Albany that would deal with campaign finance reform. It would stop the proliferation and spending of this wasteful money in a campaign on the state level. And how do I know that? Because when I was in the city council and I was on the governmental operations committee, we wrote the law to make New York City elections the most strict in the country as far as spending. The reporting, the amount of reporting on a city council race is incredibly difficult, incredibly intricate, but why? Because it benefits the people on a city council race to see where the money's going and there's caps to how much people can give a campaign. It's great. It's great for the people. We need to do the same thing on the, on the state side. So I'm saying, let's limit the big money uh, contributions that influence elected officials. Let's limit this kind of stuff. We're spending on junk. I'm very happy. I, I did the recycling event a couple of Sundays ago, and I was on the line greeting people, and they said, you know what we're recycling today? You know what we're shredding? All that negative mail on you. I said, thank you very much. And by the way, we're up to 125,000 pounds of electronics and recycled textiles that are not in our landfills to the recycling event. So I want to thank all those who have participated. But I have a plan. I have four pieces of legislation up in Albany that would change this, change the spending up in Albany when it comes to campaigns. It would make it much, much more beneficial for our people and stop the wasteful spending on stuff like this. Right, thank, you. thank you very much, everybody. Who did that last? Who, who chose? You chose? You chose? Uh, oh, no, you chose him. I chose him. All right, Joe, your turn to choose. Yes, sir. Talk about the wasteful paper. What about phone calls? <laughs> hey, you know what? I'm, I'm going to apologize now. There's uh, 17 days left. You're going to get about a dozen phone calls, <laughs> if not more. And you're going to get it from all these people. The Pope may call you and say, hey, go. So, yeah. so the idea here is we apologize. Listen, and why do we do this? Why do we do this? It's about voter contact. You know, and I'm not saying about the good people here in this room, but there are people out there that... They really have to realize how important the local race is and certain the presidential race, and we want to make sure they understand that and to get out and vote. So the mailers aren't going to stop. I'll apologize. The phone calls aren't going to stop. I apologize. I promise you, and I don't make many promises as elected official, but on November 7th, it all stops. I promise you. <laughs> Eric, do you have anything to add? All right, you get to choose. So someone else? Some, someone back here with a question? Tom. All right. I just like to know. Um, the, uh, a few weeks ago, we had the Queensway slash reactivate the rail line issue come up. It was a very hot topic. Right. Uh, I agree with the Block Association that neither plan was 
uh, really adequate, but I'd like to know your opinions of it. Do you have opinions one way or the other, or neither way, and there's no wrong answer here, so right. please. Yeah. I, I, no I was actually, I, I agree with you and, and the Block Association. I, when I got that email that day at my desk, I read it, and I said, wow, because I didn't know what you were going to say, actually, because you led into it one way, and then in like the third or fourth paragraph, you kind of explained uh, your no position. Uh, not a no on e either one, but just you know a neutral position. Um, there are many people that I represent in the Rockways right now who are in dire need of better transportation, who want to get to Manhattan in under an hour and a half time. Um, unfortunately, I don't think that running a railroad or, or spending you know, close to a billion dollars trying to reactivate a railroad line and, and dragging it through a bunch of residential communities is the right answer. I don't think it's feasible. Now, uh, I have a colleague in government, Phil Goldfeder. He feels very strongly about this. This is something that he is pushing, and I commend him for advocating for better transportation. But he hasn't shown me, number one, how he's going to pay for it, and number two, how they're going to do it. So if this is something that you really want to see, show me the money. Where are we going to get the money from? Right now, the MTA is talking about raising fares unfairly you know, and cutting other services. Where are we going to get hundreds of millions of dollars that it's going to cost to reactivate the old Rockway Beach Rail Line? Now, with respect to the, um, uh, the Queensway, uh, there was a feasibility study, ironically, that was uh, funded by Congressman Weiner about six or seven years ago, uh, that also said this would cost a lot of money. And there are people who think it's a great idea because they turn on New York One <coughs> and they see um, the um, High, Line. High, High Line. The High Line is a public-private spo uh, sponsorship. There is about $50 million of private money that goes into the High Line in Chelsea and Manhattan. You know, of, of donors and people who have been very generous and people that live in those communities. I'm not sure that we can duplicate that here. I have doubts. So I want to see this study. I don't think that we can raise 50 to $100 million of private money. I don't think that it exists in this community and for that people have that money to give. And I certainly know, being in the city council, that the city does not have an extra $100 million to spend, you know, on planting shrubs and bushes and creating bike lanes on top of railroad tracks. I don't think that that is feasible at this very moment, but I think that the Block Association coming out with this position was very good to say, let everybody cool the jets, let's learn more about this, let's study this a little bit more, let's see if we can come up with funding or if there is funding out there that we can get, and then let's move forward in the future. But right now, I don't think anybody should rush the judgment, but I do not support reactivating right now the Rockway Beach Line. I'm still open to the Queensway if, they, if we can find a way to come up with the money, but I agree with the Block Association. The position is neutral. All right, thank you. Joe? I don't care about residents, and I don't like when you raise the optimism or hope of people down in Rockaway or strike the fear amongst those in the north by saying this is a possibility of this rail plan. And so therefore, we should not raise the hopes or strike the fear of people. There is no, there is no possible conceivable way for the MTA to open up this because they don't have the money. Right. And they haven't come to the table with even, they haven't even come to the table with even suggesting that they're interested. They don't have it. So we can't even talk about the rail. As far as the Greenway is concerned, I think there's a many environmental issues here. And we're, I think we're millions of dollars away from recognizing a Greenway, uh, Greensway. I know residents who live right on the rail. They bought their home knowing that that rail would never be opened again. And I care for those people. Uh, why is this brought up? Certainly the rail, they need to increase transportation. That's the bottom line. So as an elected official working with a hybrid agency of the MTA, which I've had the experience working for ten, with 10 years now, uh, we need to explore viable, credible alternatives to opening up that rail. I, we mentioned about increased bus, increased train, okay, even ferry service. How do we pay for it? Well, we're certainly not going to give a blank check to the MTA. The MTA is horrible in math. So we're not going to give them an MTA blank check and say, here, spend it the way you want. We know they don't spend it wisely. What we want the MTA to do before they raise fares or tinker with the Metro card, before they do anything like that, and, and really sustain a very critical service on the backs of our riders, we want them to look in the mirror, like the city did in 2002, like the state did in 2009, make your cuts. Now, Joe Loda, head of the MTA, said he made his cuts. I personally don't believe him. I think if you look at the administrative costs of the MTA, it's huge. There's a lot of money in the administrative costs. I'm saying streamlining. 
Make sure you made those cuts and prove to us you truly made those cuts while maintaining service, while maintaining the uh, maintenance of, of the uh, rail cars and the buses, but prove to us as a people, show us that you made these cuts. And then let's talk about funding. And certainly on the state level, we are getting better over financially. We may be able to help them. We did fund some of their capital projects to purchase things and build things, and that's okay because that creates jobs too. But I also say this, we have still a long way to go in our $132 billion state budget to find money. Medicaid fraud and insurance fraud alone can waste about $6 billion. So if we attack that even more so, and I know Governor Cuomo started, but if we do that even more so, then may free up some more money, some more money for the MTA. But we have identified the issue, now I have a plan to go forward and try to address the issue. But certainly opening up a rail line that the MTA doesn't want to open up or can open up is not the solution. And the Greenway, personally, I think is environmental issues and a lot of cost ahead of them. Thank, thank you. you. Thank you. All right, I want to thank, uh, I want to thank both of you thank for, for you, coming out today. And, thank you. Uh, you know, we're going we're gonna to finish up, give you both a chance here to close up. Um, I just wanted to ask you guys just one quick question. When, when you guys were both topless on the cover of the Chronicle... <laughs> you know, I had a better body. <laughs> <laughs> I'm older. <laughs> <laughs> you got to hit the gym. Yeah. <laughs> now, I want, I want to thank you and t tell you both, we, we, you know, I think I speak for, for just about everyone in this room that we, we really we like both of you very, very much. We respect you both. And, uh, and and we, we wish you both well. So what we're going to do is we're going to we're going to wrap up. And Eric, let you go first. Just a, a quick closing uh, closing sure. statement. Okay. All right. Very uh, very very quickly. I, I want to thank obviously again the, the Block Association. Forty one years going strong. You had a terrific uh, dinner dance. You had some outstanding honorees. There are so many wonderful people in this community that I've had the privilege of working with and serving in the city council, and it would be a tremendous honor for me if you gave me your vote on November 6th and asked me to go to Albany to fight for you. We know the issues. We talked about some of the local issues. We know the state issues. There are many things that Joe and I agree on. There are some things that we disagree on. When you go to the polls, I know that you're all going to make a very informed decision on the issues that are important to you. If you want someone who's going to fight for job creation, to support small businesses, to strengthen the middle class, to keep our streets safe, to address the state issues and the local issues, there, is, there will be no issue too big or too small that my office and that myself will not handle. You know, if you want someone to fight for you and to be there for you, I'm hoping that you'll give me your vote on November 6th. And again, I want to thank you. This has been uh, terrific. You have a great turnout. I don't know any other civic that meets on a Saturday and gets, you know, this amount of participation. I think it's a testament to how much people care about this community and, and, and the great people here that fight for it. And I want to commend you. And again, thank you for that. And of course, thank you, Joe. Thank you very much. I want to thank you and the board for the work that you do all throughout the year, and certainly the graffiti work. I think that is phenomenal work that you do in the community. And to the residents who are here, thank you very much. Um, it, it's, it's, again, it's about experience. Uh, I've had 10 years experience working here in Woodhaven, certainly the last three and a half as your state senator, and it's about continuing that experience to let it work for you. Uh, we're keeping this campaign positive. It's about issues that matter to people. My focus will always be the people, people first. Now, often Albany, what, what plagues it a lot, plagues it a lot of time is politics before people. No, it should be people before politics, and that'll always be my focus. Helping Democrats and Republicans, whoever reaches out to me, it's about helping them because, again, people care about their community. It's about unfinished business in Albany. You know, we have, you know, big environmental issues that I have worked on and we need to continue to work on, like hydrofracking, the single most, in my opinion, important environmental issue of our time, protecting our drinking water. Gun control. We got to get the illegal guns off the street. And I'm all for guns. You want to own guns? That's great. I believe in the Second Amendment. But nobody's shown an assault we weapon, an AK-47 with armor-piercing bullets. I don't think any individual should should own. So we're looking for an assault ban. Uh, it's about creating jobs, and I have the experience of creating jobs. But it's creating more jobs along Jamaica Avenue and helping the small businesses at Resorts World and other places, Atlas Park in Glendale, growing jobs. And I have that experience. It's about creating jobs. It's about protecting our families in schools. And again, as a member of the Education Committee, schools is, is a focus. Protecting our seniors as a member of the Asian Committee. I want to protect seniors. As a member of the Veterans Committee, we want to look out for our veterans who, again, served our country. It's about taking that experience and making it work. So if you stand for good government, if you stand for someone who's worked for you 24-7, we still have the 24-hour live operator service. First time people in the Senate District have 24-hour access to their state senator. If you care about that, you stand for good government, people first, 
and someone who's been there for you in Woodhaven, then I hope I can get your support again on November 6th. Thank you very much, everybody. Here.